that's why I spent time sharing the truth of God's word that Christ saying that he really came to set the captives free. He came to destroy the works of darkness. And he came to reconcile people to God. And there, you don't have to go to Iraq to be able to just help people. Do y'all know that? Oh my goodness. Right here where you live in your lane. Hey friends, you're listening to the Victor Marks Podcast with Victor Marks, founder of All Things Possible Ministries. Welcome to the show where we bring you real conversations facing life's hard truths, stories of redemption, and the latest from the front lines. Whether you're on the road, getting your day started, or finally settling in, we've got an exciting new episode planned for you. So let's dive into today's show. In this week's episode, we continue with part two of Christ is on Your Side, a unique message Victor gave at Calvary Chapel, Joplin, Missouri. Join us again for a fun and inspiring blend of story, experiences from the field, and truth from the Word of God that we're sure you'll enjoy. Here's Victor Marks with today's message. He's talking about demons. He's talking about death. I don't like this, man. If you stay fearful, not, not, if you don't know the Lord personally in a relationship, you should be worried. Because you, you don't have any power over demons or death. You should be very concerned because your eternity is in the balance. Sharing the truth of God's word that Christ saying that he really came to set the captives free. He came to destroy the works of darkness. And he came to reconcile people to God. And there, you don't have to go to Iraq to be able to just help people. Do you all know that? Oh, my goodness. Right here where you live in your lane. The hotel we were at, because I spoke to some men, Lamar and then some other little town. The lady working at the uh, the front desk. The first night, because I came out, first night I walk in and, you know, hi, and talk. And all of a sudden, I can't sleep. It's, you know, 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm on Iraqi time. Right? I'm walking around with my dog. We start talking and. And uh, she starts kind of telling me things. She's divorced. Try to get in a relationship with another guy. That didn't work out. Got some kids. and you know, I'm like, ooh. I'm looking at her really going, man, I'm looking at my mom, you know, when I was a kid. And I was like, do you know there's, I can give you some relationship advice. I said, you know, I'm married. We got it going on. I said, I, I like sharing truth. She's like, okay. I said, but one, there's a spiritual component to all of this. There's actually a realm where there's evil. Do you believe in evil? She was like, yeah, I mean, I guess. And I said, it sounds like you're driven. Because I said, honestly, you're, you're, a, you know, you're a beautiful gal, and you can tell you're smart, you know, but, but you sound stuck. And, you, and like you're about to repeat some very not good cycles. And she's like, I know. I said, there are demons that study and stalk humans because of the battle between good and evil. I said, you want me to tell you? I can kind of give you a little hint if they're, you, know, you got any after you. She's like, yeah. I said, that's what I tell gals. You know, you get, you get out of the shower, you're getting ready, you, know, you look in that mirror, uh, and you just clearly hear, you're ugly. You're a tramp. You're this, you're that. You know, no one's going to ever love you again. You're this, you're that. Boy, she goes, yeah, I hear that all the time. I said, no, you're, you're really good in the fitness. I said, you do, you do self-assessments all the time working out. But I said, when you hear these negative things in your mind, are they saying, you are? You're ugly. You are worthless. You are. And she goes, yes. I said, that's another person. She goes, oh, my gosh. I go, yep. I just pulled back the veil for you. There are demons that are seek to drive you, to destroy you, take your joy, well, take your life. That was the first night, right? And I said, hey, look at my name. Me and my wife got a love story in, in a movie. I said, uh, yo, what's that movie? And she said, I'm very interested. And then uh, we went in last night, and I brought her a book. And it was interesting because in the lobby, I had to shoot a little video with a guy named Ben Price. He's from Australia. He's an impersonator. Uh, big strapping Aussie man I mean big boy and uh, he's a bodybuilder too so she's looking at him me Jeff who's my security and travel assistant 
who's a world class martial artist, and then a guy from the from the hood who's all inked up, and we're all having godly conversation. In her mind, it's blowing her away, because there are guys that were coming in there at night that wasn't having godly conversation, right? And she's looking at, and it really ended up being a witness to her. She's going, oh my God, I didn't even know men like this existed. And we're all married and fat and happy. Right? (laughs) That night, last night, we start talking. I give her my book and stuff. And and I said, you know, all this really bases around, it's important that we are reconciled to God and what the Bible says, born again. I said, and I kind of went for it. I was like, has anybody ever, like, told you about the gospel? She goes, no. Right here in Missouri. The belt buckle, the bobble belt. Never heard the gospel. I said, can I share it? Sure. So I just explained the cross, Jesus Christ, the redemption, what he did for us. By the time I finished real short, I said, is there any reason you can think of you shouldn't give your life to Christ? She goes, none. I said, you want to pray? She goes, yes. I was all right, let's get you born again, girl. She prayed with her eyes open. Lord, just come in my heart, forgive me my sin. Boom. After she's done, tears coming down her eyes. She's like, I don't know. <laughs> Give you a hug. I think she picked me up for a minute. <laughs> Man, isn't that what it's about? And God loves. Right, I mean, here, here in this town, here in the, I was going to say diligence. We ain't in Iraq, but, you know. God wants to touch people. He wants to touch people. I'll tell you one story about Iraq. I'm going to show you my pictures. Witnessing the Muslims can be tricky. Predominantly because a lot of them want to kill you. And uh, just the ones that, like, are angry. But most Muslims are the most caring, loving, moral people you'll ever meet. Tell me if I'm lying. Y'all there, y'all know. When I talk about moral, they, they, they have values. Uh, oftentimes, women won't even shake a man's hand because they don't, they don't want to even want that contact, right, for any weirdness. Isn't that interesting? You know, yeah, a lot of them are in bondage because of all the excessive, but not all of them are in that level of bondage. Does that make sense? And um, we were west of Mosul. It was the beginning of the offensive to free it and... You know, we're out there, we're actually sighting in our weapons. You know, just Some people said, I saw you had a weapon out there. I'm like, yeah, but I, I'm not like going after to try to kill people. I just try to keep them from killing me or us or people we're helping. I've had Christians go, what kind of missionary work is that? <laughs> yeah, I said, well, let me ask you, Christian, do you lock your doors at night? It's okay. If you ever see me on TV with war paint and I'm crawling like Rambo looking for something, it's a little excessive. This car pulls up. And when cars roll up in the middle of nowhere, you get a little anxious. And everybody's like, hey, hey. And this guy jumps out of the car and he starts yelling, my wife, help my wife, help my wife. Small car. Well, look, I see a woman in a hajib. Uh, come, uh, I mean, completely... You know, that's just a little bit of her face black. And I'm like, ooh, oh, man, there could be something in there. She could she could clack off on us. could be something in that trunk. And uh, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I felt called to go that way. <laughs> uh, I'm a lot more courageous at distances, I'll tell you right now. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, go. I'm like, go, oh, here we go. So we're walking up, and he's, he comes, he says, she is having psychological problems, psychological problems. I thought, I just finished a movie on trauma. How, how does this work? I'm in the middle, it, it, it's like I'm being punked. All right, what are cameras? This is a good one. My film crew, what y'all doing? No, she was having psychological problems, and he was driving toward a medical, you know, an Iraqi medical unit. We were the only Americans out there for anywhere, right? So I look inside, and she's been burnt. 
And then I, ooh, I felt myself get tense because I'm thinking, ooh, you burn your wife. Because there's that segment of abuse that happens. I was like, man, I'm going to hurt your feelings. Uh -huh. Use the ministry of laying on her hands. <laughs> and, uh, and then he explained that she keeps having these horrible thoughts to hurt herself. I said, what are the thoughts? She said to drink poison, burn myself, and cut myself. I did, I mean, I did an assessment for trauma, and no doubt she was traumatized. But I said, I said, I, I think this is something else. I said, do y'all believe in evil and demons, literally? And they're like, yeah, because Muslims do. I said, I think this is demonic. I think this is something evil. And I said, uh, do you mind if I pray for her in Jesus' name? It just got real. <laughs> you know what? She looked at me and said, is Jesus alive? I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, he's very alive. And he loves you. And I, I, I'm sure he can help in this situation. And they go, yeah, pray. So I prayed against demonic forces, dun, 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 boom. And then she goes, my mind, my mind is free. She goes, my mind, it, it's good, I can. And I thought, oh, my gosh. We, it was amazing, the instant response and freedom. Jesus had her free. Now, can you imagine when they drove back to their little village, and she's in her right mind, and she's not always trying to drink poison, burn herself, or cut herself, and people look at her going, whoa, man, what, what happened to you? And she goes, Jesus healed my mind. He delivered me from the demons. That's a pretty good witness anyway. You go around it. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. There's plenty of evil out there, but we have Christ on our side, right? And uh, I don't know about y'all, but I kind of like making the devil ticked. Because if you follow Jesus, one of the verses in Ephesians says he came to destroy the works of the devil. Here's the key to it, and I'll land and show you my pictures. Here's the key. I think there are, one, a large segment of people around here that just need to get really saved. I mean, genuinely, you, you need to get born again. You know religion, you know, you, but you, you don't even like church. You don't read the Bible. You're not into it. And it's like, oh, do you even really know Christ? I mean him. And if you're honest, some of you got to say, no. No, I don't. I go get me a little bit of church sometime, and my wife drags me down and, you know, drugs me. <laughs> you notice your Benadryl bottle's going way down before church services. Oh, I'll go. You just need to get saved. Really, really saved. And then there are believers. You got to get over fear. You got to get over these lies of that the enemy is planting in your mind. You got to get you got to replace them lies with truth. Can you imagine me if I kept believing what I did all my life as a kid, tortured as a young kid, electrocuted, dunked in a tub till I passed out, a lot of horrible stuff. My mom married six times, fourteen schools, seventeen houses. I man, I was so insecure. You cannot even imagine. And when we're insecure, we'll do things to try to compensate, right? And I was into drugs. I, I couldn't get no girls when I was a young teenager. I mean, I'm like, what's wrong with you? Nothing. <laughs> Lonely, empty, finally found a place to take me in. You know, give me food to eat. And a weapon with the Marine Corps. And uh, <laughs> I was like, so I can shoot people legally? You got issues, young man. <laughs> yeah. Come on in. But that was back, <laughs> hey, that was back when the Marine Corps was thin on people, and we were using muskets back then, so <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> but um, people say, what about your grandparents? Because if your parents were messed up, well, you know, one of my grandparents, grandfather died in a mental hospital. It was the same mental hospital that my dad actually had to go to. I literally thought, well, we got a timeshare there? Because, I mean, I guess I'm up next. <laughs> I, I mean, I grew up for sure. I mean, even, in, even into my marriage, I would say, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Because crazy thoughts don't make you crazy. Y'all with me? And I'm like, I'm not crazy. My wife would go, I know that. Okay. Just as long as you do. <laughs> my other grandfather, 
He caught his wife cheating on him. He killed her. Shot himself in public. That's why I hate infidelity. That's, that's why I hate sex outside marriage. Man, bad things happen. God can redeem stuff, but man, are we really better as a society for having sex before marriage? Are we really better? Are you really better for having sex before you got married or sex while you married with somebody else? Is that really, is that really better? I never forget a gang member in L.A., a juvenile. He, I never forget. I was talking about purity. He goes, it ain't all that it's cracked up to be, man. I said, you speak the truth, young lawyer. And that was a group that ended up saying, look here, I think the best advice I can give you outside of spiritually, because it was the largest juvenile prison in the country, 35,000, I think it was 35,000 cases a year in one county. How's that for issues, right? I said, I think you should wait to have sex so you get married if you stop and just do it the way. I said, I think if everybody... Man, if everybody did it God's way and just waited, man, woman, in marriage, that's it. Our world would be better. And this kid, because it's a tough kid, he raised up his hand. And you knew he was a leader. Guards, every other row, they were like, you know, hey. He was like, I got to say something. I got to say something. I'm a preacher, man. And they call me the karate preacher, man. Isn't that funny? And uh, I said, no, no, go ahead. He goes, he stood up and he goes, Hey, yo, man, that's crazy. You're saying, I, you know, I ain't supposed to do nothing I'm married and just, you know, that's it. he said, uh, I got to share my love with all the women. You know? I was like, yeah, man, but you're sharing more than love. And I, uh, he said, how would it be better? Ooh, I didn't really plan a response for that one. It just sounded good when I said it. Like, you know, unicorns and flowers. And he's down there. You tell me how it's going to be better. Because trust you me, kids locked up, they ain't dumb. There's a lot of leaders in there, a lot of smart kids. And that's when I went, oh, Lord, you got to help me. Boom. I said, you'd have a dad at home. He goes, dang. And he sat down. I said, how many of you would have never have to hear your mom and dad fighting because of bad things happening? Divorce wouldn't be like it was. Some of you would actually have a dad because he, he would have stayed with your mom, married her, um, and just on and on. You never have to hear your sister know that she was raped. I said, some of you young men would never have to hear your mom bringing a dude in at 2 a.m. from the club. And you know what's going on. All you want to do is grab a knife and stab that guy in the neck. I know what that's like. You could see young men, hot tears coming down. Because even though gang members, part of, they know there's a sacredness in their mother not sleeping around with a bunch of dudes. I said, the world would be a better place. I said, a five-year-old boy would have been never abused and locked in a cooler left to die. I said, that was me, 1970. I said, conversely, what God offers is, just take my life. I'm married 28 years, five children. First person in three generations to never cheat or be cheated on or be divorced. And I love my wife, and we have great prayer times together. <laughs> we expound the word. We have a little bit of revival. If Christians don't talk about it, if we don't do a counter message, you think our kids in this culture are ever going to care? Oh, my gosh. I tell our kids, hey, I told my kids growing up, when you don't even know about sex, you come and talk to daddy because I'm the expert. <laughs> and my wives always talk about how intimacy is healthy and good and it protects your marriage and, you know... She even tells women in women's conferences, it's good for your endorphins, lady. It gets you happy. <laughs> the men are like, y'all ought to have a women's conference here. 
funny. We've given up ground to the enemy in the area of what God made and designed. We let the world movies and all that dictate music to our kids and culture, what that's about. Shame on us. I'll say one more thing about that since I'm on my hobby horse. Gay marriage, how we lost that in the Supreme Court ruling and, and all the Christians are mad and all the money that was spent. Huh. I remember telling a group of conservative Christian leaders, influences our country, I said, we wasted too much time and money on that issue and we lost it. You want to know why? Because those so many guys and people standing up and holding signs and being uh, uh, had horrible marriages at home. They're looking at porn. Oh, uh, they're not doing the gay thing, but you know what? They're, they're looking at, they, they don't have pure power against forces of darkness. They're just trying to do something that, you know, well, yeah, we're not going to. Man, I'll tell you what. If Christians had better marriages, you think a number of homosexuals, don't look at that, especially when they're in their marriage and it ain't going good. I mean, you think your marriage struggle, people in the gay lifestyle, it ain't easy. I mean, uh, we had some neighbors, two ladies that, you know, were married and all that and had a kid from different. And I remember she, she would walk her baby, the, you know, around and she's kind of the tough one. She'd walk her baby around in a mop bucket. <laughs> Put blankets and a mop bucket and a rope and she'd pull that baby around the neighborhood. And she turned a corner, and that little baby would go. <laughs> and I went out there, and I would end up start walking with her. I'm like, hey. I said, you ever think about a stroller? We get you one. She's like, ah, this works. I said, it's funny. I ain't going to kid you, you know. And, uh, and she goes, and we had that conversation one day. She goes, yeah, yeah I, know, I know. I know who you are. She's like, yeah, I guess you're going to tell me my lifestyle. I said, I ain't got to say nothing. Except, how hard is it? She goes, and when she knew I wasn't going to judge her, she's like, you, she left. She'd been gone for two weeks. And she's using drugs again. I'm like, gosh, can I pray for you? She's like, yeah. That's funny. People don't turn me down from praying for them. Even Muslims. I got a few Christians who will. You just take that somewhere else, man. Okay. That's all. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. We'd love to stay connected with you and invite you to the conversation beyond this podcast. You can check out more of the work we're doing around the world at victormarks.com, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all linked in the show notes. Be sure to drop us a comment in the review section if today's show has impacted you in any way or if there's anything you'd like to hear more of. We're always encouraged to hear from you. Thanks for spending your time with us. Until next time.